Imam Abu Hanifa stopped his study circle, got on his horse, took his horse to the governor's palace. When the governor heard that Imam Abu Hanifa was coming, he sent all of his missionaries to, to, to receive him. He himself got off his throne and set, set Imam Abu Hanifa down on, on the throne. He said, what can we do for you, O Imam? Imam Abu Hanifa said that my neighbor is a drunk. You guys put him in jail last night. I want him out. This is what I have to do for my neighbor. Imam Abu Hanifa got him out and then put him on the horse, walked him back towards home, and on the way home said to him, now tell me who is there that, not, that hasn't answered your song. Meaning the song the man used to sing was, who is there to help me? I have no one. I have no one in the world to help me. Imam Abu Hanifa helped him and then he related the song to him back. And said, look, I was extremely ashamed and said, I want to join your study circle. How can I join it? And Imam Abu said, you're more than welcome. That man then came to that study circle regularly every single day and became one of the mujtahideen within that uh, study circle. That was Imam Abu Hanifa, how he used to respect his neighbors. Now, his piety. His piety is, you can't even discuss. The Zahabi himself writes that the accounts of the piety and devotion of Imam Abu Hanifa have come to us from so many chains of transmission. I've heard about Imam Abu Hanifa's piety from so many ulama and from so many people and from so many teachers that there is no way it can be in doubt. Meaning it's come to us with tawatu. This is what they used to say about, about Imam Abu Hanifa, about his piety. One time, one of the famous people of his city was, who was very well known for his worship came to visit Imam Abu Hanifa at Isha. He saw Imam Abu Hanifa was actually sitting and crying, reciting an ayah over and over again. His beard was wet with tears and he was sobbing and breathing heavily. Imam Abu Hanifa was. The person decided that I shouldn't disturb the Imam right now. He's very close to his Lord. I'll come back at Fajr and talk to him. So the person went, to, went home, went to sleep, came back Fajr the next day. When he came back Fajr the next day, he saw Imam Abu Hanifa sitting in the exact same place, sobbing the exact same way. And Imam Abu Hanifa was saying under his tongue that... Uh, he was saying under his tongue that Ya Allah, you are the graceful one I am the one who sinned Is there any room for, in, for Nu'man in your Jannah? This was Imam Abu Hanifa He had reached that maqam And he's crying and saying these things So he had reached an extreme degree of piety Now, Imam Abu Hanifa's daily routine How did he live his everyday life? I mean, isn't that important for us to know? How should we model our lives after him? Well, every day after morning prayer He would, he would sit with his class in the masjid he had his regular students who met him every day and they would sit in a circle and they would study. So that was the first thing they would do. Then they would actually take questions for fatawa and all of them would sit in a circle and they would answer the questions together and this would go all the way until Zuhr and all these different things were recorded. At Zuhr, Imam Abu Hanifa would go home. If it was the winter, he would actually go and spend time with his family. If it was the summer, he would take a short nap and then spend time with his family. By the time Asr came, they would have a second round of teaching. They would again gather and he would teach a new group of people. After that, he would teach for a short period of time and between the time for us and Maghrib, he would then go around the city. He would visit sick, he would visit relatives, he would feed the needy. Those were the things that he liked to do between us and Maghrib. After that, for after Maghrib, there was a third session. A third session when all, the stu- when all the students would sit and learn and he would teach. Then that would go until Isha. After Isha, all studying was closed and he would devote himself to private devotions all night. He would sleep a portion of the night and then pray a portion of the night. And this is what, this is what he did every single day. Regularly, consistently, such that Noman became Imam Abu Hanifa. Now, how was Imam Abu Hanifa as a son? He had a mother, he had a father. How did he treat them? Well, Imam Abu Hanifa's father died at a very young age. And Imam Abu Hanifa's mother actually lived to a very old age. So, what's really famous about Imam Abu Hanifa's mother is that during the time that Imam Abu Hanifa lived in Kufa, everybody was involved in the deen. Everybody, every house, every child, every parent, everybody was completely devoted to the deen. And there were a group of people who were the preachers of Kufa. There were a group of teachers who taught Adam, who taught knowledge, who would make sure that people would get their, their knowledge correct. But then there were another group of people who were considered the preachers. They would come into the masajid and they would give eloquent speeches about Islam and raise people's iman and get them excited about the deen. And this was a separate group of people who were professionals at this. They were considered the preachers. Now, most people in Kufa who didn't understand knowledge would often go to these preachers to ask because you tend to go to the person that's the most evident, the person that happens to speak the best. And so people in Kufa would often go to these preachers and Imam Abu Hanifa's mother was one of them. So what Imam Abu Hanifa's mother would do is when she had any question about fiqh, instead of taking it to Imam Abu Hanifa, who was the greatest faqih in Kufa at that time, Imam Abu Hanifa's mother would say, I want you to take me to... Amr, Amr, who was this great preacher, and let's ask him the masala. Let's ask him what he says. 
So Imam Abu Hanifa would actually take his mother on the, cam- on the camel to the preacher, and then together they would ask Amr what the an- or Amr what the answer was for that particular question. Now imagine this, Imam Abu Hanifa, the person who people are coming from all over the Muslim empire to take fatwa from, himself is taking his mother on his camel to Amr, to Amr, who himself did not have this knowledge but was a preacher. Who was his goal was to just teach, or just to encourage people. When Imam Abu Hanifa would show up with his, with his mother, Amr himself would say, what are you asking me for? You're Imam Abu Hanifa, you answer the question. So often what they would do is, Imam Abu Hanifa would tell Amr the answer beforehand, and then Amr would repeat the answer, and then the mother would be satisfied. One time, you know, on, on occasion, Imam Abu Hanifa's mother would say, okay, my son, what do you think? Right? And sometimes the mother turns to the son. She said, you're Imam Abu Hanifa, you have all these students, you have 1,000 students, you have 40, 40 uh, fuqaha within your circle, what do you think about the masla? Then Imam Abu Hanifa would give his answer, she'd say, you don't know anything, take me to Amr. So then he would take her back to Amr, and then Amr would give the exact same answer. But this was, I mean, this was the way he treated his mother. He didn't say, I'm the faqih, why don't you ask me? Why don't you ask me what the answer is? Amr doesn't know, he's just a preacher. He himself took his mother and let her get the answer that, he want, that she wanted. So this was just a beautiful way in which he uh, interacted with his mother. His taqwa, we've already talked about, his legacy, a very beautiful hadith uh, in both Bukhari and Muslim, that the Prophet ﷺ said that even if the religion, even if, even if the deen were somewhere far away, in the, uh, in, for example, another planet, even then, a person from Persia would have taken this hold of it, or from somebody among Persian descent, and would have found that deen. Were Islam to be some, at some far away, intangible place, the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith from both Bukhari and Muslim that there would come a person from a, from Persia who would take this deen and bring it back to the people. And Imam Suyuti, who's a very famous muhaddith, one of the greatest ulama of our, of our ummah, himself said that many scholars are unanimous upon the opinion that this hadith is talking about Imam, about the coming of Imam Abu Hanifa. So that's Imam, that's Bukhari and Muslim. You can't ask for anything more. Muttafaqun alayh. The hadith is Muttafaqun alayh. And Imam Suyuti, one of the greatest imma, a Shafi'i himself, is saying that I thought, and many of the scholars that I studied under and taught thought that this hadith was about Imam Abu Hanifa. So it shows you that his legacy was incredible. His taqwa was incredible. And the proof is in the pudding. 50%, over 50% of the Muslim ummah today follows the method by which he, which he used to derive from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. More, the majority of the Muslim empire, for the majority of its time, in the majority of its courts, in the majority of its lands, has dealt and judged according to the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa. His methodology of looking at the Qur'an and the Hadith has been used across the board. 1400 years of it. Now, this, this is a statement from the Prophet ﷺ. There's also very, another famous hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said from Imam Abu Hurairah, Abu Huraira, related to Imam Muslim, that we were sitting in the company of, all, of Allah's Apostle Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Surah Al-Jum'ah was revealed, and he, he recited it amongst them. The Prophet ﷺ recited it amongst them, and they said, and then said, uh, he then questioned of, of some question, and, he, and Saman, the, uh, Saman al-Farsi was amongst them. The Prophet ﷺ placed his hand on Saman al-Farsi's chest, and said that even were this deen to be placed in some faraway intangible place, somebody from amongst your descent would bring it back to the people. And we talked, we talked, we talked about earlier that Imam Abu Hanifa's family was from the, from the family of Salman al-Farsi. Now, Imam Abu Hanifa, I talked about his madhab, that's the proof. All the stories, they don't mean anything. The proof is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted him. That's the proof. The proof is in the pudding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted him such that the majority of the ummah, for the majority of the time, in the majority of the land, in the majority of its courts, have ruled according to this madhab. Ruling according to this madhab means they've analyzed the Qur'an and the hadith according to the way that he outlined how you should look at it. That's essentially what a madhab is, and you're going to get a talk about this tomorrow, inshallah. What does it mean? What does madhab mean, etc. Now, the Imam al actually died in the year 150. 150, he was actually put in prison four years before that. He was then uh, by Mansur, who was, one of the, who was a Khalifa at that time. Mansur sent him to prison because Imam al Hanifa refused to work for the government. He refused to work in a court. He was sent to prison, but then Mansur began to realize that Imam Abu Hanifa has way too many students. And unless those students are allowed to continue to learn from Imam Abu Hanifa, there is no way that Mansur will be able to keep his popularity, so Mansur let him out. Later on, when he saw how much popularity Imam Abu Hanifa had developed, Mansur became jealous, 
he, poisoned, he put Imam Abu Hanifa back in jail and then poisoned Imam Abu Hanifa. And Imam Abu Hanifa passed away in 150 after Hijrah.